All right, Daniel chapter number 9 is where you'll find the text tonight. Daniel chapter number 9. And this is called the backbone chapter of all biblical prophecy because this chapter deals with a lot of important prophecy that comes up later in the book of Revelation. Remember, I've told you on multiple occasions that Daniel and Revelation are sister books. You really can't understand one without the other. Of course, the first half of Daniel is all narrative and then you come into the back half of Daniel and the prophecy starts, which is where we are. And we've now come to Daniel chapter 9. Now this chapter is broken into two sections. In verses 1 through 19, Daniel says a prayer. There is the prayer of Daniel. In verses 20 through the rest of the chapter is the prophecy. And Daniel gives yet another prophecy. So you can divide this chapter easily into two pieces, prayer and prophecy. But the prophecy is not so easy to interpret, uh, as you can imagine, and more, even more difficult to apply. And so, that being said, we're going to look at each piece separate. When I used to preach this ser series, Discovering Daniel, I would preach this whole chapter in one sermon. I, I won't do that anymore because there's just so much you have to skip in order to do that. And so I've broken it down into two sections. Of course, all this is on the podcast and you can get to the podcast from our new website very easily, very user-friendly, modern, and streamlined, and uh, it's, it's just awesome. You need to go check it out, but this will all be on the podcast, the entire series of Discovering Daniel. So like I said, in verses 1 through 19, we have Daniel's prayer. In verses 20 through 27, we have a prophecy, so you can break it down into two uh, pieces. And so we're going to look at the prayer tonight. So Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 1. I'll let you remain seated because it's a lot to read. In the first year of Darius, the son of Aswarius, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations of Jerusalem. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll begin our exposition. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. I pray that you would forgive us where we fail you. I pray that you'd illuminate our minds and our hearts to receive, thus saith the Lord. As we discover Daniel, Father, may we find not just Daniel, but what may we find Christ. Lord, and I just pray that you take this text and use it to transform our hearts and make us more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Awesome. Okay, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. So chapter 9 opens up with Daniel giving us the time of when he received this prophecy. He says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So this took place clearly after the fall of Belshazzar in the first year of Darius's reign. Now, I remind you, Belshazzar was the king of Babylon whom God wrote against the wall, and Daniel interpreted the writing, and that same night, Belshazzar died uh, by the sword of the Medes and the Persians who took over afterwards. You remember this comes to us in Daniel chapter 5 where we see the writing on the wall uh, or the blunder of Belshazzar. So that's back in Daniel 5. So what Daniel's talking about now is after that has happened, after Darius, the king of the Medes and Persians, had come to power. So we get a little bit of a timeline here. And we find Daniel doing what all men of God should do, and all Christians for that matter. He's studying the Word of God. Uh, he writes, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of the years specified by the Word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel is studying the book of Jeremiah. He tells us that. We don't have to guess which prophet he was studying. He tells us, I was studying the, the Word uh, given through the prophet Jeremiah. And he is talking about in Jeremiah chapter 25 where Jeremiah preaches and prophesies this uh, 70 year desolation. Jeremiah said, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now, the question is, was it 70 years from the time Nebuchadnezzar defeated Jehoiachin 
and Babylon took over uh, Judah or and Israel, or was it seventy years from the reign of Darius? Now we're unsure, but either way, this time is coming to an end. And so Daniel sees that, and he begins to pray to the Lord that the Lord would bring these things to pass. Now, it seems odd to say that. Why would Daniel pray that something would happen that God already said would happen? And you may be tempted to think, well, then there's no point in praying. You've missed the point of prayer. Prayer is not really to change things. Prayer is to change you. And so we pray Lord Jesus, come quickly. We know he's coming, so why do we pray for him to come? Because we want our hearts to be aligned with his heart. We want our will to be aligned with his will. And so that's why Daniel prayed that. This is all introduction, by the way. I'll get into the meat of the message, but I want to set the context uh, for you. So Daniel prays for this. Now, this prayer is seen in four parts, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, this prayer of Daniel in four parts. So I've entitled tonight's study, Daniel's Penitent Prayer for the People. Daniel's Penitent Prayer for the People. You know what penitent means. It means a repentance, a contrite heart. It is a prayer of seeking forgiveness for sins. And he's doing that not just for himself, but for the nation and the people of Israel. But notice he includes himself in that number. Daniel is so humble. He doesn't say, no, God, your people have failed, but you know, I I didn't go along with them. He says, we, we, we. He includes himself in that number, and you'll see that come through in the text. So Daniel's penitent prayer for the people. We're going to dissect Daniel's prayer into several divisions. First of all, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, Daniel is convicted by the Scripture. Daniel is convicted by the scripture, verses 1 through 3. Second, Daniel confesses the sin of Israel. Daniel confesses the sin of Israel in verses 3 through 11. And then in verses 11 through 14, thirdly, Daniel concurs with God's judgment. So Daniel is convicted by the scripture. Daniel confesses the sin. Then Daniel concurs with with God's judgment. That means he agrees with God. And then lastly, Daniel calls on God for mercy. In verses 15 through 19, Daniel beseeches God seeking mercy and forgiveness, not only for the people of Israel, but for himself. So we see it this prayer in four pieces. Daniel's penitent prayer for the people. Let's look at number one. In verses one through three, Daniel is convicted by the scripture, by the scripture. The Bible says that, I just read it to you, that it says, I, Daniel, understood by the books. What books is he referring to? Well, he tells us Jeremiah, he's referring to the prophets of the Old Testament, specifically the writings of Jeremiah. So what's Daniel doing? He's studying the scripture. And I want to tell you something. This wasn't a one-off for Daniel. This is something Daniel did every day. Day. You know, we sang the song several weeks ago. Oh, Daniel prayed every morning, noon, and night. He did. And guess what else he did? He studied the scripture every day, probably morning, noon, and night with the prayer. You can't have one without the other. And so Daniel is studying the scripture, and he comes down to Jeremiah chapter 25. Now, we know chapters and numbers were added later, that the book didn't have chapters back then. It just said Jeremiah in the book. But it would be where we have a 25th chapter. And he comes across this prophecy, and he's convicted by the Scripture. You understand that? It's the Scripture that has the power to change your life. It's the Scripture that has the power to convict you of your sin. It's the Scripture that has the power to give you not only correction, but direction. And it's all about the Bible. It only comes from the Bible. You can't get this anywhere else. Because what I can talk you into, somebody else can talk you out of. But what God says is permanent. You either accept it or you don't. And so the power's in the book. The power's not in the preacher. I'm not the best preacher in the world. Far from it. I don't think I'm the worst either, but I'm certainly not the best. But the power's not in me. The power's in the book. I remind you, Charles Spurgeon, the greatest Baptist preacher that ever, I didn't say the greatest preacher that ever lived, I said he was the greatest Baptist preacher that ever lived, 
was converted in a Methodist primitive chapel with, when the pastor wasn't there and somebody from the congregation who was not the pastor just stood up, read the Bible, stumbled through it, made a few comments and left. And that night, God used that probably the worst message that ever been preached to save the greatest preacher of our Baptist heritage. So what's that tell you? That the power's not in the preacher. The power's in the message. Okay, and if God can use a donkey to talk, he can use me too. Okay, so uh, we see Daniel is convicted by the Scripture. He's studying the Bible and it, and, it, and it grabs him. And it shakes him. And it searches him. You know why a lot of people don't like to read the Bible? Because it reads them. Amen or oh me? I don't, I don't like to study the Word of God. I know you don't because it studies you. It's the only book in the world that will read you. Every other book you can read, this is the only book in the world that when you read it, it reads you. It's a living book. Hebrews 4.12. It's living. It's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It cut, You know what a two-edged sword does? It cuts going in and coming out. It cuts both ways. And so Daniel is searching the Scripture... And the Lord illuminates his mind. So Daniel is convicted by the Scripture. So by way of application, before I move on, God's Word brings conviction in the lives of believers. I'll give you an example. This morning, I was reading my Bible, and I was convicted of things in my life. Sometimes things that didn't even have anything necessarily to do with what I was reading. That's how powerful the Bible is. <laughs> the Bible can bring things to your mind. And the Spirit of God uses the Bible to bring your sin to your mind so that you can confess it. So that you can kill it. So that you can mortify the flesh. John Owen, that great Puritan, said, Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And the Scripture does that. It's like a cleansing. It cleanses us when we read it. So Daniel's convicted by the Scripture. Let me give you some examples that back up what I'm saying. So you don't think that I'm just making this up. David said, you remember David, the one that killed Goliath? Y'all know who I'm talking about? You do? Okay. David, I'm being smarty pants. I know you know who David is. David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. So the word gives me direction. You say, well, I, you know, I don't know what to think. I, I'll never forget. <laughs> oh, and I was frustrated. I was talking with somebody of a, of a different flavor of Christianity. And, uh, and they said, I asked them about, you know, this was back before, uh, this is in about 2013. And I said, you know, we were, this was before the legalization of same-sex unions. Now, you say, well, gay marriage, I won't call it marriage because it's not marriage. I won't, you can redefine it, but my God said it's not marriage. I've got to agree with him. I belong to him. I don't have a choice. I belong to him, and he's me. You know what I mean? And so nevertheless, not I live, but Christ in me. Some of you will get that in a minute. But I said, well, what do you think? Well, we're praying to see what God wants. I said, you don't have to. He already told you. It's in the book. You don't have to guess what God thinks. He told you what he thinks. He said in the beginning, and I've been reading through the book of Genesis in my quiet time. You know what I found? In the beginning, God created them male and female, period. End of story. You don't have to guess. We don't have to, we don't have to you know, be Baptist and form a committee. It's in the book. The Bible says what it says. So it gives us direction. It tells us what's right and what's wrong. But it also gives us correction. Same David, same Bible. Same chapter, Psalms 119, later on, David says this, Your word have I hidden in my, say it louder, in my, that I might not, oh, that word nobody wants to talk about no more. Say it again. Sin. Sin against you. The Bible will keep you from sin. The Bible will convict you. And God uses the, the Spirit of God, uses the Scripture of God to correct the saint of God. You couldn't have alliterated that any better if you wanted to. Anyways, moving on. And so we see the Word of God is, 
living now. You say, well, pastor, that's Old Testament. I love when people do that. That's old. Like that just wins the argument. Okay. Well, how about some New Testament? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Did you know it's biblical? This is, the, this is the cheesiest joke ever. You ready? It's biblical for a man to make the coffee in a marriage. You know why? Because the Bible says he brews, not she brews. <laughs> is that not stupid? Anyways. <laughs> Listen, I can't even make coffee. That's why I have those little pods. It does it for you. Hebrews 4.12 says this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. Daniel is convicted by the Scripture. And that's why we need to study the Scripture because God shows us things in our life that need to change. And then through the Scripture, He shows us how to change them. And by the Spirit of God, He gives us the power to change them. And so the Scripture is very important. So Daniel is convicted by the Scripture. Now, after Daniel is convicted, he confesses. That's the big ticket, isn't it? It's one thing to be convicted. It's another thing to confess it. If you're convicted about something being wrong, but you're not willing to confess it, that can't be helped. You understand? So after he's convicted, he confesses. And he does that in verses 3 through 11. We see Daniel confesses the sin of Israel. He says, then I set my face toward the Lord God. I'm in verse 3. To make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, watch this, and made confession. And said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned. You know why a lot of people never get saved? They can't admit that. They can't admit that. We have sinned. They get a case of what I call the yeah buts. Yeah but, yeah but, they can't just say in their heart and mind and truly mean it, we have sinned. But Daniel has no problem doing that. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face. As it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel. Those near, those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them. Because remember God, when Israel split into two countries because of the sin of David, you had Israel and then you had Judah. And then both of them fell to pagan kings. And he says, even those that have been spread out in this diaspora, as it's called. He said, all of us are guilty of the same. Because what? Of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame to our face, to our kings, our princes, and of our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets, i.e., the scripture. What was he reading? Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a pro- He wasn't a bullfrog. He was a prophet. <laughs> and it was the scripture. Can I just paraphrase what Daniel just spent two paragraphs saying? We didn't obey the book. There it is. I took my kids through a catechism. That word scares a lot of Baptists because they don't know what that word means. That means that I ask them questions about the Bible and God and they answer according to the answers that are given. And it's a memorization tool that teaches them doctrine. And I ask them, what is sin? And they say, disobedience to God's law. That's what sin is. It's when you disobey the book. 
the Word of God. He said, we've disobeyed. We've disobeyed. We have not done what you told us to do. Verse 12. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. So in verses 3 through 11, after Daniel is convicted by the scripture, Daniel confesses the sin. He confesses the sin. But I want you to notice something about this confession. Notice the posture of this confession. I set my face toward God to make request don't don't break chair to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes. This is not just okay, I did it, I won't do it again. Sackcloth, the garments of repentance, ashes, they would sit in ash heaps as a sign, that was a cultural sign of mourning. And he fasted. He did without food for the purpose of prayer, seeking God's mercy. Daniel has a contrite heart. Daniel, there's not a hint of an excuse or blame passing. You know, well, I didn't do it. They did it. You know how Adam and Eve did? Adam said she did it and Eve said the snake did it. You know, none of that. No self-righteousness. Well, God, you know, I've been preaching it, but these people ain't listening. And that was true. Okay, He was preaching it, and they weren't listening. But like a true leader, he took responsibility for their actions as well as his. And he says, we have sinned. So the posture of this confession is humility, repentance, contrition. Remember, God gives grace to the humble but he resists the proud. The Bible teaches us that. Now, I, I said he confesses his sin. What does confession really mean, though? You know, because th- there's, that's kind of, you say, well, I know what it means. You might think you know what it means. We have been trained that confession just means an admittance of guilt. Right? Like, it, like in the Roman church, they go in the box, you pull the little box back, and you say, I've been a real bad boy. And he says, well, say a few Hail Marys, drop a 20 in the plate next mass, and move on. You know, That's not confession. That's just an admittance of guilt. You know, like when somebody gets caught doing something, they say, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I mean, okay. You know, I mean, that's like we catch a serial killer. I mean, do we, would we accept this when they caught Jeffrey Dahmer if he would have just said, nobody's perfect. Made a mistake. You know. No. It's not confession. Confession comes from a Greek word that means you agree, you declare openly a deep conviction of facts. Confession means you agree with God that what you did was wrong. Not just agree that you did it. Unfortunately, We've got confession and admittance switched. I mean, I can admit things all day long. Confession means I agree with God that I'm wrong and he's right. And that's a matter of the heart. That's not a matter of the mouth. David, it came out, I mean, Daniel, it came out of Daniel's mouth, but it's because it was in Daniel's heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. And so he confesses his sin. He assents and agrees with what God is. But not only the posture of his confession, but notice the nature of their sin. What was it? It was disobedience. Daniel said, we didn't obey your law. All sin, if you boil it down, okay, and there's different types of sin. I understand that. Lying, stealing, kiss, uh, killing, just <laughs> killing, <laughs> destroying, etc., uh, what was I saying? Wheeling, dealing, kiss, dealing. Ric Flair got in my head or something. Anyway, <laughs> there's all kinds of sins, but if you boil it down, woo, sin is disobedience to God's law. And Daniel said we sinned. That was the nature of our problem. He said that we rebelled against a righteous God. And he said we've done wicked and we've rebelled. By departing from your judgments, Daniel 9, 5 through 6. So Daniel, in a posture of repentance, confesses the nature of their sin, which was direct disobedience. Let me ask you a question before I move on. 
Do you make it a regular practice to confess your sin? And, and I'm sure many of you do. Because you've been, you were raised a good little, a good little uh, Protestant like I was. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. First John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Right? You, you were trained that. Okay? That's good. But is that you just admitting, just going through the motions? Or are you like David when he said, search me, God. Search me. If there's something in me you don't like, God, kill it. Get it out of me. And then when God brings to your mind this or that, you say, you're right, Lord. I'm sorry. That's biblical confession. I'm not talking about a guilt trip. I'm not trying to, to uh, make you, you know, hurt your self-esteem. You shouldn't have any self-esteem anyway. I don't. The only thing I'm proud of is Jesus. Amen. Paul said, I don't boast in anything except the cross. Paul said, the only thing good about me is Jesus in me. So if you ever see anything good about Brad, just know it's not Brad, it's Jesus in Brad. And so I'm not, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is true confession. Daniel is confessing his sins. He's agreeing with God that what he did, that what they're doing is wrong. God desires that. Did you know that? Psalms 51, 17 says that the sacrifices of God are a contrite heart. Contrite heart. And it didn't take us long to mess that up, did it? Because guess who, guess who the first person recorded in the Bible that got that wrong was? Cain. Cain brought a sacrifice. And people say, well, he, he brought a sacrifice of, of, of food. Well, there was some food sacrifices in the, in the Levitical law. If you study that out, there was some in there. The problem was... Cain brought the sacrifice. He went through the motions, but his heart was hard as a rock. As hard as the rock that he hit his brother with. No pun intended. The sacrifice God desires is a contrite heart. And you can go through the motions of confession without actually confessing. People do it every day. I mean, we like to pick on the church of Rome, and I, and I brought that up as an example. But I promise you we did the same thing. Because as I said before, how many of you growing up a good little Protestant, you were taught what before you went to bed? Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to give us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You were trained to say that every night before you went to bed. So was I. But are we truly confessing with a contrite heart? And that's what Daniel's doing here. How do you know? His actions backed up his words. He didn't just say it. He's fasting. He's in sackcloth. He's in ashes. He, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, the actions are matching the words. And so we know this is true confession. So after he is convicted, he confesses. But after he confesses, he concurs. He concurs. Look at verse uh, 13. Says that as it is as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is what righteous. What's Daniel saying? He's saying God. You, you've poured this judgment out on us. We're living in a foreign land being ruled by uh, those that are pagan and they are ruling us. But God, you're righteous. In other words, God, I agree we deserve this. He didn't say, God, this just ain't fair. And let's not talk about fair. It's not fair that the darling son of God was slaughtered like an animal naked on a cross. That's not fair. So let's not talk about fair. He didn't say, God, you, we don't deserve this. Oh, no. Daniel said, you know what, God? You're absolutely right. You're righteous. You're right. We deserve this because we disobeyed you. And we brought the division between us. God didn't move. They moved. And let me say this by way of personal application. If you've allowed sin to creep in your life and it's affecting your walk with Jesus, and it will, it's not that God moved. I just don't feel close to God. He didn't move. You moved. When you allowed sin to get in between you and Jesus. 
And that's why we need to truly confess our sins daily. And every chance we get when God brings something to us from the scripture, like, oh my goodness, okay, kill that in my life, God. Turn away from it. I repent of that. Why? Because that keeps us close to Jesus. No, it's not a matter of losing your salvation. Because you can't lose what ain't yours to start with. The Bible says salvation is of the Lord. But we can be out of fellowship with God. We can be in a far country. As Charles Stanley said, you can be in a far country without ever leaving the pew. Because it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the mind. So, he concurs with God. He said, you're righteous, God. You're 100% right. God is merciful to those who repent. That's the best news. So we see that he concurs uh, with God. So after Daniel concurs, we come to verses 15 through 19. Daniel calls. He's convicted by the scripture. He confesses the sin. He concurs with God's judgment, which is really part of confession. And then he calls on God for mercy. This is the best part. So now that I've really upset you, let's get to the good part. Verse 15. And now... O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our father, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds. Because our righteous deeds couldn't get us nothing. But because of your great... Mercies, O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Lastly, David calls upon God for mercy. He goes to the source of mercy, and that is God alone. God alone can forgive sins. God alone can give mercy. And that's what true repentance leads to. It leads to us depending on God for mercy. And you say, but pastor, sometimes I I, I don't hate my sin like I should. I know you don't. That's a struggle. We read after the Puritans all the time. I'm going back and rereading through the Valley of Vision. And the Puritans dealt with that. You need to ask God to help you to hate your sin. You need to ask God to help you to love him more. You feel so many times, oh, I don't love God like I should. Ask him to help you you to love him more. That's what repentance really does. It leads you to dependence. Repentance leads you to dependence on God. Daniel goes to God for mercy. And he says, it's not because of our righteous deeds. Because they're not that righteous. Right? Our works of righteousness are as filthy as... Rags. Daniel says, I'm not appealing to my righteousness, God, because I don't have any. But because of your mercy. Oh, thank God for his mercy. It's his mercy that we're not consumed. It's his grace that we are saved by. It's not something we've earned. It's not something we deserve. It's not something you can... You know, do enough for God and then he'll give you some mercy. No, it it, it is strictly an act of God's goodness towards sinners that when we repent and confess, which really are two, two in the same to a degree, he says, have some mercy and grace. He says, I forgive you. He appeals to God. He calls on God for his mercy he says, before that, he says, let your anger and fury be turned away. I just want to deal with that for a moment. Often, we hear people say, well, God's not mad at you. He's just disappointed. There's a problem with that. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. Do you know that? No, no, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. 
But I bet more than half of you have been taught that. Well, God, God's not mad at us. He's just a little upset. God's not human. God hates sin. God's thrice holy. Isaiah barely saw the back of him and almost died. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. Every day. But those who repent find mercy. And his anger is turned away. The ultimate example of this is that God turned his wrath away from sinners and poured it out on his son. Isaiah 53. I know we say that as human parents. I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed. Even though we know it's not true because you are mad at them. Right? Am I not the only parent? Some of you are not purposefully not making eye contact with me because you know I'm telling the truth. I looked over there and Daniel and Tanya are doing this. I'm just kidding. I just picked on them because I know they won't get mad and send me a nasty email after and we say that. We're not mad at you. We're just disappointed when you really are mad at them. Okay, God is mad at them. God is angry with the wicked. He has a right to be because he's God. He doesn't have to explain himself. Remember when Job got really upset at everything that happened and he begins to question God? And God says, who do you think you are? Where were you when I created the Leviathan? Where were you when I formed the worlds? In other words, Job, be quiet. So God was angry. God was furious. He's angry with the wicked every day. But, but, I don't want to leave you there because that's bad news. But there is good news. But what makes the good news good is the fact that there is bad news. The good news is, to those who are of a contrite heart and come to God in repentance... You'll find mercy, you'll find grace, and his mercy endureth forever, and his grace is unending, and his bank account of love never runs dry, and every check he writes for grace, it never bounces. You will find grace and mercy and forgiveness every single time you come to God in repentance. And Daniel knew that. And he said, your mercies, your great mercies, not just your mercies, your great mercies. And so God is merciful. And Daniel says, God have mercy. And so we see that Daniel has a repentant heart. He has an attitude of abasement. So I know that Daniel was thankful for God's mercy. We should be thankful for God's mercy too. That God would have mercy on those who call on him in repentance and faith is a miraculous and comforting truth. And we find this truth elsewhere. 1 John 1, 9, Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. We find that he does give mercy. To the repentant. He does give grace and forgiveness. To the repentant. Repentance cannot be taken out of the gospel. Or you don't have a gospel. Repentance can't be taken out of the Bible. Or or, or, are you really. The Bible becomes nothing. Repentance. Turning from sin to God. That theme. Is from Genesis to Revelation. Over and over. You see it over and over. Book of Judges. You see the cycle. They disobey, God sends the judge, they repent, God restores, they disobey again. Sounds a lot like us, right? No, y'all are too spiritual. The theme of repentance is all throughout the scripture. So we find Daniel's penitent prayer for the people. Daniel intercedes on behalf of the people. And then the rest of the chapter, he gives a prophecy that is deep and wide and tall and fat. And we'll deal with that next week. But I wanted to deal with this prayer separately because it's so ap- applicable to all of us. To all of us. This applies to all of us. Because, you know, okay, if this don't apply to you because you're perfect, raise your hand. You know, nobody's going to raise their hand. Because this applies to all of us. And so we see that uh, Daniel's penitent prayer for the people. We notice several things. First of all, Daniel was convicted by the scripture. Uh, Second, Daniel confessed the sin. Third, Daniel concurred with God's judgment. And fourth, Daniel called upon God for mercy. So let me ask you a question in closing. When you pray, do you confess sin in a sincere manner? Do you agree with God that the judgment you may have in your life is just? Do you plead to God for mercy and grace? Or do you sometimes, and none of us are perfect, okay? 
I, I'm not saying to you that, you know, if, if, if your prayer life is just perfect, if not, you're, you're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. Or do you sometimes take his grace for granted? Because I know I do. And I'm, if I had to guess, everybody in here sometimes does. We take God's grace for granted. Let's not do that. Let's be thankful. Let's be repentant. Let's be, let's be uh, have a contract heart. I mean, we're pretty good at hating other people's sin. Let's hate our own. I mean, you know, let's all be haters of our own sin. And so, do you pray that way? Perhaps if we prayed like Daniel for ourselves and for our church, for our nation, then we too could see revival and deliverance from the captivity of sin, which is the greatest captive there is. You know, the Israel thought Rome was their biggest problem. Jesus said, I came to save you, but not from Rome. I came to save you from yourself, your own sin. So if we prayed like Daniel, this is why we're called to search the scripture. Study it carefully. That's what Daniel did. He was searching the Bible. And God uses his word to convict us. And when we are convicted, let's confess and concur with God. Lastly, let's call upon God for mercy every day. Because we really need it every day. The greatest need you have today is God's mercy and grace. And guess what? The greatest need you'll have tomorrow is not food and water, not money, God's mercy and grace. 100%. Greatest thing you need. Best thing I could do for you is pray for God to give you grace and mercy. Best thing you can do for yourself is ask God for grace and mercy. Because without it, we'd be consumed. So that's Daniel's penitent prayer for the people.